kinds of things that develop are a result of the conversation. Who participated in the conversation? Who, who suggested things? Um, and an interesting change that's, I think, taking place, especially lately, is the importance of the women that were engaged in that conversation that typically hadn't been, you know, listed in history as, as having an input on that. So when we're talking about John Stuart Mill today, Harriet Taylor was present when all of his major works were written. And Mill says, you know, she was, you know, a, a very important influence on, on all of that and the inspiration for doing it. In other words, they're her works, <laughs> not his. Isn't that, isn't that a way to, to think of it? Because uh, yeah, I, I mentioned last class uh, um, that the book Magnificent Rebels points out how important Caroline was to all of the works of romanticism that inspired everyone. And she never gets any credit because at the time, the wife didn't get her name in the publications. It was always printed as the male writing it. And yet, as we saw from uh, her husband's letters, without her present, his mind just couldn't concentrate. He couldn't get the work done. So, you need, you need the woman there in order for this to happen. And she never gets her name. Still today, if, if you look at the translations that um, William uh, um, Schlegel did, Wilhelm Schlegel, uh, the German translations of Shakespeare are considered his, but from the letters you could tell that they're actually predominantly hers. And that's just totally unfair, you know, um, just because it was the cultural thing. One of the things that Mill does, uh, that we'll, we'll hopefully mention today if I remember it, is uh, um, argue about the importance of, of women having rights. You know, at the time, uh, I think it was, I'm trying to think what year it was, um, but, but women couldn't own anything. They, they, they couldn't have their money, they couldn't even have their children if they got divorced. Uh, divorce was, you know, like something that just never happened. But, I mean, basically women were, like slaves. And what's kind of neat is in the uh, book, The Subjection of Women, that no. Harriet Taylor wrote with John Stuart Mill being the, the official author, um, uh, you have this Hegelian dialectic between the master and the slave, or the servant. And basically, uh, you know, as, as Hegel describes in his master servant uh, you know peace in the phenomenology it's actually the servant that's the dominant one and mill uses that argument and in fact it's considered a classic uh, uh, quotation from the phenomenology that he does this to point out that, that the wife is really the one that's dominating the husband it's not the other way around you know? And, and so they ought to have, you know, credit. They ought to have the vote. They ought to be able to sit in juries. They ought to be able to have careers. Uh, you know, all that stuff. And by the way, when he published that book, she published that book, the whole world basically reacted in scorn. Like, what? That's a horrible thought. You know, why, why on earth would you think women should be doing any of this kind of stuff? So, exactly. <laughs> Why? By the way, that's one of the neat things in uh, the Barbie movie, which I watched on Monday night. Boy, Ken. I really feel for Ken. Yeah. 
You know, he's a perfect 10. You know, um, but I'm just Ken. And without Barbie, he was nothing, right? And you think, you know, well, that's the way people treated the Ken doll, right? And by the way, notice that a lot of people are very concerned with the amount of males that are not succeeding in high school and not going on to college and not developing careers. I think women are dominating the academic scene right now, roughly 60, 40 percent, right? Yes, you didn't know? Here, here is certainly the case, 60 yeah. percent, I, I think. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a, it's an issue, it's a, it's a sociological issue. Why are males feeling like they ought not to be as academically uh, brilliant you know, as, uh, as women? You know? I, I remember I used to teach part-time uh, substitution, right? Subsi subbing? What do you call it? The subs that come to high school or whatever. I used to do that um, um, years ago. I was still teaching here, but I, I, you know, whenever I had time, I, I was on the list so they could call me. And I remember um, one time at Chugiak High School, mixed class, um, we were talking about uh, uh, history, and, and uh, at that particular time, I think we were talking about following the text we were talking about um, uh, the Roman Empire becoming Christian. You know, under this sign will I conquer, you know, uh, this is Charles Mag Magnus, uh, or Charles the Great, Charlemagne, right? Yeah. And uh, um, when uh, I got to a certain point, I, I asked the class a question. I looked at the class and I said, do you, you who are, I forget how I phrased it, you, the girls, I said, do you deliberately act dumb so that the guys don't feel like you're superior to them, so that you are attractive? Right? In, in other words, if, if the, the way the study read, read right, that, that women and uh, young, young girls in high school deliberately try to act dumber than the guys so that the guys will like them. Because if they're too smart, the guys are kind of turned off. And I, I asked that question, and according to their faces, they were all saying, yes. <laughs> the guys were clueless. They totally missed it, right? But it was pretty clear from the way that the, the girls all looked that yes, that they, de they deliberately tone down their brilliance in class because they don't want to appear too brilliant to the guys in the class. And uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. Why would you do that? Um, I, I mean, I mean that was another thing too, especially like in May in high school, it was absolutely clear to me why the guys couldn't concentrate because the girls, you know, they were trying to look as beautiful as possible. And actually, I imagine at that age especially, guys couldn't concentrate on anything with beautiful girls sitting in the class with them. Um, well, really. Um, I, I confess, I, I totally missed out on this issue because I was raised and, and grew up in an all-male uh, high school. Uh, so there's 3,000 of us there and not a single female in the, in the whole building. No teachers, nothing, right? So I, I remember seeing the strange females across the way. because You could see them in the distance. You knew that they were wearing, they, they had, you know, skirts and, and uniforms. No, we didn't have binoculars, but they... Someone had some. I said telescopes. Telescopes. More we actually night. had telescopes at night. Uh, Father, um, oh gosh, I can't remember his name, bald guy. But he took us up on the monastery roof with a telescope, and, and, and also we had camera that we could set so that we could get the 
the circular uh, circumnavigation of the stars. Cool, cool physics class. But no, um, that was crazy. But so I asked at Chugach High School years ago, and so that, that interesting dichotomy that, that women hide their intellect, and, and I, I mean that's that's John Stuart Mill is is uh, um, broaching that subject in his uh, uh, subject subjugation of on the subject subjection subjugation it begins with this. Oh, I'm sorry. That was Beethoven 7, in case you were appropriate time-wise for the, at least, that era. Um, so, John Stuart Mill. Boy, that's an ugly picture of him, isn't it? He was younger once. Um, and then he got old, he got really old and died. But he's our, our main person today. But what I wanted to run and, and uh, get to was um, the book, what was the name of the book? Subjection, Sub Subjugation of Women Works. Method, theory of liberty, social liberty, tyranny, liberty, freedom. Racial equity. Subjection. The subjection of the women. Notice this is part of what I was actually talking about. From what we know, Harriet Taylor was the main uh, writer of this book, the one who inspired it, etc. cetera. Um, and, and actually quite a few of his books at that age, he didn't write those books until he was married to her. And so, hmm, right, there's, there's that interesting uh, uh, issue. Um, oh, it was 18, I think 1870 was after he published this book, 1861. It was a couple of years after that that the British finally changed the law and allowed women to have rights and stuff. So that's that was actually, a, a, I'm pretty sure, uh, a book that had that kind of impact in its day. Here we go. While scholars generally agree that John Stuart Mill was the sole author, it is also noted that some of the arguments are similar to Harriet Taylor Mill's essay, The Enfranchisement of Women, which was published 10 years earlier. Um, okay. <laughs> so somebody needs to take a stick to those scholars and smack some sense into their head. Hmm. Okay. Well... So, what are we doing? I um, should mention that even though I don't have a specific test question that you could pick that's uh, targeting John Stuart Mill and utilitarianism, uh, I will argue that uh, the question concerning pragmatism and American culture is closely tied in uh, to utilitarianism because pragmatism is in a way just another aspect of utility, utilitarianism. What's fun? What is a person? What is a person? Yes, that's a very good contemporary. I've already mentioned Douglas Hofstadter, I am a strange loop, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that one makes your brain hurt. That's good. That's, you should have that kind of problem from this class. It's, it's like when you're doing push-ups. You do enough of them that it actually is improving your muscles. It's sore for a while. Yeah, if it's sore. 
And the brain is a muscle. So you, you know, try studying Russian for 10 hours a day. Oh. <laughs> oh, well. all right. So that's good. That's a good thing. Um, all right. So let's look at utilitarianism and why. Oh, I already did that. So here we go. So why is this a follow-up to Hegel, keeping in mind that Hegel